Welcome to the final year Family Medicine Undergraduate Teaching Curriculum. Today with this session we are going to look at how you are going to manage emergencies in general practice. So you would take some of these points to augment your knowledge about you know in about any discipline at the same time there are like unique ways how you would approach emergencies in primary care which is quite different from the way you uh, you might be approaching in a hospital so we will appreciate those differences as well as we go along so moving on to the objectives we will try to understand what an emergency is and list emergencies involving uh, different systems of the body. So, well, you will not be asked in your examinations to list emergencies involving the cardiovascular system or the genitourinary system. You will not be asked in that manner. But uh, just to get an idea like which and which sorts of conditions can become emergencies, so we will uh, go through some of them and then to have an idea about how prepared a GP should be to manage the emergencies we will just rush through this part and to be vigilant of potential medical legal issues when you attend emergencies and then principles of management of any emergency in primary care so there are a set principles that you um, adopt when you manage emergencies just to be cautious that you don't miss anything and this is uh, an exam point as well so if you are being asked to write an answer as to how you would attend to a patient presenting with chest pain in one of your structured essay questions then uh, even even say in one of your clinical examinations even if, if you are supposed to explain to the patient as to how you are going to manage the emergency um, you will have to you know stick to these um, you know these principles when you address such situations and you will be marked on um, these principles whether you get them all right and in the end we will go through uh, case scenarios where you will have to divide yourselves um, among yourselves into uh, groups as per the number of uh, questions you have and then you will be required to um, um, present each of the answers for the few case scenarios that we are going to look at and um, yeah and and there will be no volunteers but i will be appointing someone from within you to present from each group so what is an emergency it is a highly volatile dangerous situation requiring immediate remedial action so volatile does it mean it's vashpa venasulu it's kind of that it is a critical situation so you, if you act fast, you might, um, you know, help the patient in some way and, you know, even save the patient's life, save the patient's eyesight, save the patient's limb that is threatened. But if you don't do something very quickly, that person is going to be harmed by that delay. Right. And the nature of emergencies and who decides whether it is an emergency or not so is it the patient who decides is that the relatives neighbors or health professionals like you so it actually depends as the health professional you should be able to see okay this patient is um you know very silent but has very low blood pressure so the patient is about to collapse as the health professionals you understand that even though the patient is not very communicative or even if the patient is unconscious or subconscious but the relatives will see a different aspect the patient is in severe pain 
So that bothers the patient. So then they will look at that instance as an emergency as well. So we have to respect that. And in the case of if you attend to emergencies in a village setting, there will be pressures that will be applied on you by the relatives as well as the neighbors of the patient. So you must be in a good position as a good communicator to be able to resolve that, those kind of issues. Then how does, you know, um, attending to um, emergencies in primary care, how does that differ from working in accident and emergency work in a hospital? So there are time pressures with minimal staff. In primary care, you don't have all these full um, cadre of nurses, attendants and all that. So you have maybe one nursing officer with you so that you will have to work as a team between yourselves and do the best for the patient. And the time pressures because you are the only physician there in some instances where you will have to attend a several emergencies at the same time. And you will be held responsible as the sole clinician there. If um, something goes wrong, if even an act of medical negligence occurs in a hospital setting, the hospital also takes the responsibility of that negligence to a certain extent, which you called is the vicarious liability. But when you are practicing all by yourself, the responsibility of um, something going wrong is um, your responsibility, right? It's, it's up to you to remain answerable. So uh, you, that is quite a, a um, challenging situation. And then there are social, psychological and physical problems associated with um, the, the emergency work. And the primary care physician may be able to provide a complete solution in some instances, even say in if the patient is presenting to you with an acute attack of bronchial asthma, you should be able to provide a complete solution and send the patient home and even put the patient on long-term inhalers, uh, prophylaxis. So if it is not the case where you cannot manage the situation in the primary care setting, you will have to do appropriate referrals to either tertiary care or secondary care as it is appropriate. And home visit emergencies, what about that? Are you supposed to go to a person's home just because the patient is having a heart attack? Well, that is again totally up to you or um, your, the, your practice policy should decide whether you are doing home visits at all for emergencies or you just give them support or advice over the telephone for the patient to go to a hospital and what to be done before the patient reaches the hospital. So some advisors over the phone. So it is up to you. And you may also decide in your practice policy whether you do home visits for routine patients, for palliative care patients, but not emergencies, or you take both of them on board in your practice. So it is up to you. So emergencies involving different body systems. So cardiovascular emergencies are really common. So I will not go through the entire exhaustive list that includes um, myocardial infarction, left ventricular failure, stroke and hemorrhage. But say a condition like anaphylaxis, do you attribute anaphylaxis to occur only in the cardiovascular system? No, it is. it actually involves almost all the body systems when the patient goes into a state of cardiovascular collapse, when the blood pressure is very low, the heart cannot be pumping adequate blood into all the organs, leading the organs going into failure. The brain circulation, the renal circulation, gut circulation, whatsoever. And at the same time, it also involves the respiratory system where all these bronchospasms, mucus hypersecretions, and everything occurs in the, you know, even, even pulmonary edema, plural effusions can occur in the um, respiratory system that 
causes respiratory embarrassment in the patient. So the, it doesn't just involve one system, it is a multi-system problem. And if you go further down, um, yes, and to be able to manage cardiovascular emergencies, it is important for you to have basic equipment such as the ECG machine or even a cardiac monitor to monitor the basic parameters. So then there are respiratory emergencies, acute exacerbations of bronchial asthma or COPD or airway obstruction. And look at epiglottitis. What is so special about epiglottitis? This is actually, a, could be a spot diagnosis where you just spot the patient and without wasting time, which is very valuable in this in the stage where you manage emergencies. You don't waste time but diagnose epiglottitis on the spot. So what will be the typical presentation? A child between the ages of one to six presenting with some amount of stride or crying in agony and maybe silent at the same time because um, if the child cries more he will become more breathless and um, the child will be, you know, stooping forwards. There will be some drooling of saliva. So those are indicators that uh, aids you to diagnose epiglottitis without wasting much time. Right, then, then there are surgical emergencies, like something like testicular torsion, where you need to know the time frame within which the, ch the child or the adolescent should reach the hospital. So it is really important. And then strangulation of hernia. How urgent should you be referring the patient to the hospital as opposed to an, to an uncomplicated um, inguinal hernia uh, versus an obstructed hernia versus a strangulated hernia. So there is a guidance, a, a crude guidance given in the, even in the uh, the hand, Oxford Handbook of General Practice, if you would look into it. So the time frame for routine referrals is you can take more than two weeks to do, um, you know, do routine referrals. And urgent referrals are happening between 24 hours and two weeks, whereas emergency referrals are supposed to occur within the first 24 hours. But it is up to you, but that is a very crude guide, but you have to decide based on the situation how urgent is the referral. So for torsion, that is an emergency referral, testicular torsion, but you cannot be waiting for 23 hours to refer the patient, you have to do that immediately. As for strangulated hernia, yes, you have to refer within hours without uh, making, you know, without wasting much time. For obstructed hernia, yes, maybe you can take mm, 24 to 48 hours. So it is your clinical judgment that decides the level of emergency, how, how urgent the referral is. Okay, and then there are orthopedic emergencies, say um, fractured neck of the femur. Is that an emergency? Well, you know, the, the fixation of the neck of the femur might not be an emergency. But at the same time, if there, are, there is hemorrhage or a forming hematoma within, or say if it is a, a fracture of the humerus, then you would be worried whether there are associated damage to the neurovascular structures leading to hemorrhage and the, it could be a life-threatening situation. So be conscious about that. Then there are gynecological emergencies like pelvic inflammatory disease, bleeding, ectopic pregnancy, obstetric emergencies like postpartum hemorrhage and all that. So then there are contraceptive emergencies where there are pharmacological as well as non-pharmacological options available. Mm -hmm. So um, pharmacological, mm -hmm. you would use levonorgestrel and you have to know how the dosing should be. And then the non-pharmacological um, options like in, including a copper tea or 
even um, uh, hormone releasing intrauterine devices. So you have to go into a discussion, even in this emergency situation, you have to discuss with the patient and come up with the most reasonable and acceptable solution by you and the, and the patient. So depending on the level of efficacies of the, um, uh, the contraceptive agent and the patient's contraceptive need for how long do the patient does the patient want to be under contraception contraception so even in the emergency situation be able to communicate those things then dermatological emergencies so simple rashes versus urticarial rashes why does an urticarial rash particularly bother you because it could be a cutaneous manifestation of a systemic problem such as anaphylaxis then you would be worried so it could just be urticarial rashes a simple allergy or even a life-threatening condition like um, anaphylaxis so you have to be cautious about the cutaneous uh, you know presentations then there are injuries lacerations that would be profusely bleeding that needs to be um, corrected you know the bleeding has to be arrested very quickly then there are burns scalds and sunburns that you have to attend as well then there are neurological emergencies stroke versus a transient ischemic attack convulsions those are neurological emergencies then there are eyes and ENT problems so ophthalmolo ophthalmological problems like a foreign body in the ear um, how about an insect in the ear is that an emergency of course if the patient if, if the if the insect is alive inside the ear the the patient is usually in agony with the you know the noise the patient is hearing and the, and the sensation of its movements inside the ear the patient is in a very agonizing agonized situation so you have to um you know find a solution for that and the ways to kill the uh, the insect inside the ear if it is alive while calming the patient down and how you get the you know the dead insect out what agents are appropriate and all that you cannot be you know spraying mortin into the ear to kill the insect so yeah you should better know like how do you kill it and how if it is dead how to get it out right okay and even visual loss if it is a sudden onset visual loss unilateral visual loss something like amorous amorosis fugue so all these um, presentations you have to be cautious about them then there are social and psychiatric emergencies say the patient has a social problem that may present as uh, physical symptoms psychological disturbances so those would be the manifestation of a social problem so you have to dig deep into the problem and find a reason for this uh, distress and alleviate it appropriately and then there will be somatizers where it is again um, you know a physical symptom coming out or originating from a psychiatric disturbance or neurotic symptoms then you also face with um, acts of deliberate self-harm acts of um, you know suicidal attempts medication overdoses how do you deal with them so that is another um, challenge in even in primary care so then there are psychiatric emergencies then you have to have a sound knowledge about the mental health act as well as the mental capacity so when can I restrain a patient? When can I um, administer certain drugs to help the patient without his or her explicit consent? Without the consent, you are going to administer something. Then you have to prove that the patient does not have the mental capacity at the moment to decide. Right? Especially if the patient presents to you by all by him or herself rather than with a relative, in which case you have to ask and discuss with the relative the, the most appropriate course of action. Right. And then there are endocrine emergencies, hypoglycemia, 
diabetic ketoacidosis, Edisonian crisis, myxedema coma, thyrotoxic crisis. So if you think about the, uh, the, the general uh, endocrine systems you have, you get all these emergencies there. Urinary tract emergencies, then you have to be able to, as a clinician, to differentiate between a simple UTI versus an upper UTI, like as in a pyelonephritis. Then when would oral antibiotics be appropriate as opposed to a scenario where you need to refer the patient to a hospital to, um, you know, for IV antibiotics and more investigations that are not available with you, such as, you know, urine culture and all that. Then there's this ureteric colic. That is when, um, if you would have noticed through your you know, clinical experience over the past year, have you seen a, a stamp called HO2C stat on the BHTs? And do you think like all the time the medical officer in charge of the OPD stamps that thing on the, on the BHT in a very appropriate manner? So, yes, for your rhetoric colic, because the patient is in pain and you have to do something about it, it is essential, I think, to stamp HO2C stat there. But say there is another patient with acute abdomen, right? The patient is not complaining, the patient is very drowsy, about to lose consciousness, the patient is um, looking very ill but not complaining, even the, even the relatives are calm, they don't understand it is a very sinister situation. But if, as the medical officer there, you do not recognize, you don't, you don't check for the patient's pulse, you don't check for the patient's blood pressure, and you miss the fact that the, this patient needs to be seen very urgently, and if you miss that in that primary point of contact, that is a very serious, um, you know, I, I would say that that is, amounts to medical negligence, criminal negligence, if, because you have missed that diagnosis there. So be very vigilant. You are a clinician and you are a, you are a qualified person. You are a qualified person to treat people just because of your um, qualifications and experience and you cannot be missing uh, such um, patients needing urgent attention, urgent medical attention. Then there are pediatric emergencies. There is a range of pediatric emergencies, including non-accidental injury, which I have highlighted below. Like, then what is non-accidental injury? That is the instances where the children are being abused, usually by adults, so in, it could be a physical way, psychological way, they can be socially deprived, or it could be a sexual harassment. So it could encompass a wide range of uh, things. But then with the history, you know, with the, with the typical features in the history and examination and even the appearance of the child, you should be able to recognize maybe there is, this child might be getting neglected. You know, the child is not wearing uh, clothing that is appropriately sized oversized or very small um, um, clothing or or else like the, the the history that the parent is coming up with is not really compatible with the type of injuries the child has sustained so with all that you can judge you know at, at least suspect that there, this might be a case of um, you know child neglect or child abuse then you uh, have to take remedial action. You have to admit the patient, or if there is a, if there is a mother also involved, um, you might also have to admit her to uh, to a hospital for further assessment by maybe medical legal um, professionals, as well as um, child protection authorities, or probation and all that. So you have to take necessary steps in that instance, and. Also be vigilant about the typical patterns of injury, whether it is a torn frenulum of the lip, whether it is uh, like a bruise marks around the, um, around the mouth, whether the ears are torn, if there are cigarette butt burns, 
if there are like features to suggest green stick fractures of long bones so all these so you have to and and there are there could be um different um you know injuries of in different stages of healing that may also point towards um child abuse or physical abuse the child may be looking apathetic so that might alert you as well right the next section what equipment should a GP have? I will not go into detail about this. You can have a look in the PDF attached. And then, what drugs should a GP have? I will also not go into details about that. And then, right, so in your primary care center, there could be a receptionist who would be handling calls for you. And you could train that person to triage certain calls that you might be getting, whether it is uh, um, the basic details, you know, she might be able to take it for you so that you can attend the sooner time permits and um, do the needful, whether to get the patient down to you or to advise the patient to go to a hospital. Right. Then now, this is a very important slide because this will be the aspect that you will be marked on when you, um, you know, uh, describe how you would manage a patient presenting with an emergency, either in writing in one of your structured essay questions or in an OSCE station where you will be explaining to the patient. So these 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 things will be done on you, right? So. You know, um, in any sort of emergencies, there is this concept called the golden hour. So even minutes matter uh, when a patient presents with an emergency. You have to be very uh, confident and very, um, you know, it, it builds with your experience to be able to spot certain diagnoses, certain diagnoses like very early and attend to them in a responsible manner. So you know your A, B, C, D, so A is for airway, but at the same time remember the cervical spine stability. And in instances such as, say, anaphylaxis, you would also tag adrenaline along with your A. And if it is a myocardial infarction, alongside the airway, you will be also managing uh, you know, you will also be administrating antiplatelets with A, right? So you manage the airway and ensure that the patient is conscious and breathing, right? And then you move on to check the patient's circulation and um, do the, all the circulatory support and then assess the disability. What sort of a disability are, you, are we looking here? It is basically the neurological disability and then you also proceed on to your um, exposure and fluids with E and F but we will just concentrate on ABCD for the moment so along with this you have to also you know um, you, you, you are going to describe okay how do you uh, ensure the patient's airway is patent and secured how do you ensure that the patient is breathing and how do you, um, you know, cannulate the patient? Maybe, you know, application of two wide bow cannulae will be more appropriate if the patient has a chance of going into a circulatory shock. So, and then, so you have to be able to describe that. But alongside, you also describe the, the aspects that have uh, mentioned in bold letters. So, because they also carry marks. So, it is very important, like very early in the stage uh, of managing the patient, you reassure the patient and the relatives, okay, now that you have, um, you know, reached the hospital, it's g I'm, I'm glad that you turned up to the hospital really early because we are going to um, take care of the patient now. So I will update you about the patient's condition as we go along and I wish for your fullest cooperation here. So that only takes a few seconds to tell, but that really matters. 
And it is, again, important that you do not give unrealistic uh, reassurances here. You, so you cannot be telling, if you're not too sure, you cannot be telling, you know, the patient will be totally fine, you know, then, then, you know, that will, you know, be a, a negative point. The patient, if the, something goes wrong, the patient's relatives might shout back at you or even sue you because like, you know, as, as we arrived in the clinic, the doctor assured that, you know, the patient will be all right, but the patient is not all right and he died. Then there could be problems. So be sure that only give, you only give, you know, realistic expectations there. Then positioning of the patient, that is important. Right, if you do a certain, you know, you let the patient assume uh, one position, say propped up position, then be able to justify that. Why do you prop the patient up? Or why do you uh, put the patient's heads, head down as opposed to propping it up? So uh, explain that. Then attaching the patient to all the monitoring. So that is something that some people miss during that all that. So if you have a cardiac monitor, you should be monitoring and which parameters are you going to monitor? Are you going to monitor the pulse rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, the saturation? So you mentioned about that. Then the team approach, even if you have only one nursing officer and yourself in the clinic, how would you, you know, um, um, divide the tasks between the two of you and uh, use time efficiently to uh, manage the patient. So you will be um, inserting the patient's cannula while the nurse is supposed to attach the patient to the monitor. So you divide the work among yourselves. So just mention that you are going to have a team approach. Then, and in the end, say you would be able to manage the patient totally or else you will have to transfer the patient somewhere else for further management. So in that stage, you have to stabilize the patient. You're not, you're not just transporting a very unstable patient in an ambulance to a hospital. So you have to ensure that the patient is cannulated, the airway is patent, and there is some fluids running in before you transfer the patient. So stabilize. And in the end, it also carries marks that you mention that you are going to give a detailed referral letter uh, to the receiving institution. And it is very um, you know, prudent of you to also be calling the receiving institution and you know, inform them that, you know, just be ready that I, I'm sending this, um, uh, this uh, pregnant mother who is in, uh, you know, she is in, in, in labor, almost in labor. So be prepared to accept that person. The, the patient or the mother so um, yes each of these aspects carry marks so um, yes and now there will be a separate document in the same module where there are some case scenarios um, attached there will be a, a few case scenarios depending on the number of case scenarios you divide yourselves into the number of a number of groups as same as same as the number of questions and each group will have to um, deal with one um, particular question and then in the end there will be no um, there will be no uh, volunteers but i will be appointing someone from among you to give me the answer to the question and at that point your attendance will also be marked right so um, yes just be sure that make sure that you are you are there for the when you are supposed to answer right okay very good and thank you for listening and hope you have a good day and then you have to be very cautious about the medical legal issues involving management of um, emergencies so you have to maintain your records so it could be whether it could be um, you no know, electronic records it could be paper-based records so 
it is very prudent of you to have a record how the patient presented what was the pre wasn't presenting complaints and what were the subsidiary complaints and what did you un identify in your history and examination and the basic tests that you have carried out the findings of those tests say an ECG that you have done and then what medications have already been given um, and all that should go in a record and what was the course of action you took whether did you do a referral and if so have a referral letter with you a copy of the referral letter that has been handed to the patient so this uh, may help you if you know in in, in future there could be um, issues of litigation where the, where physicians are being um, accused by patients in such instances it is um, good that you have it is it is it will protect you that if you have all these medical records with you and what about a, you know um, you are um, um, you are in your clinic and another patient presents to you with a chest pain and uh, with a few amounts of questions you identify that this might be um, you know a heart attack and you just do nothing but you don't even have a look at the patient but just you know ask the patient to go to a hospital is that uh, you know the right thing to do maybe not because you are a trained medical professional you have to at least have a proper look at the patient at least until the ambulance arrives and if you can do basic investigations such as an ECG you can do it find the, write down the referrals and give the stat doses of medications the aspirins the clopidogrels atorvastatins or captopril give whatever the appropriate medicine before you do the transfer so that is your responsibility and then again um, the confidentiality has to be maintained so if the patient does not want to talk about certain aspects in the presence of all the relatives around maybe ensure that the patient has sufficient uh, privacy to be talking to you and always and always ensure if you do any sort of intimate examination ensure that you have a chaperone by your side a chaperone from your side um, if that is possible.